Being a sailor on a Spanish or Portuguese ship during the period of exploration and conquest was definitely not an easy life. But one can be sure that there would have been at least a few pleasures, one of which would be an occasional beach bonfire and barbecue with fresh red meat supplied by an animal that you carried along live. There are special areas in the ship's hold to keep livestock, and when the sailors made landfall, they could anchor and come ashore with an animal to slaughter and cook. I imagine it was quite a party. Thing about Spanish and Portuguese. They were, and still are, Iberian neighbors, similar culturally though rivals, in an intense competition to conquer new lands overseas, claiming them for the crowns of their respective countries. They also had distinct preferences for the kind of meat they liked to eat at these beach bonfires. The Spanish have a deep love for carne de chivo, goat meat, while the Portuguese are big fans of carne de cordeiro, mutton, the meat of sheep, which, if you don't know, is a different species from goat. Now, if they were to discover an island rich with vegetation, but lacking delicious herbivores, they would often leave behind a pregnant female, a ewe or a nanny goat, so that the island would be populated with yummy treats for any future sailors stopping in. According to legend, you could tell a Spanish colonized island from one claimed for Portugal by the species of ruminant feeding on its slopes. Got goats? It's Spanish. Crawling with sheep? Portuguese. I'm not sure how much this history reflects the actual truth, but it does set me up with a nice context for our next discussion in Bio 202 regarding the population dynamics within a two-species community. Our basic question is this. If goats and sheep are both there on an island for some reason, how do we model their population dynamics given that goats and sheep interact with each other? Each has an impact not only on their own species dynamic, but also the dynamic of the other species. In working out the population dynamic for sheep, we'll use a subscript S for sheep and G for goats. The dynamic for sheep, DNSDT, is going to have to take into account not only the number of sheep on the island, but also the number of goats, and vice versa. DNGDT the population dynamic for goats, is going to be a function of both NG, the number of goats, and NS, number of sheep. As a starting point, we'll use the now familiar population dynamic with density dependence, to which we'll incorporate the effect of an ecological competitor. Take goats, DNG DT is equal to NG RG times kg minus ng over kg. <clears throat> you should remember how with adding more goats to the population, the numerator of the logistic term gets smaller, and so does the goat growth rate, dng dt. The more goats you add, dng dt slows, stops, and ultimately reverses the growth of the goat population. Sheep and goats are ecological competitors. They occupy approximately the same niche of medium-sized ruminant herbivores, so adding sheep will also have a negative effect on goats. So, we'll incorporate the sheep by adding a new term to the numerator in the logistic fraction, kg minus ng minus ns, the number of sheep, times a factor, alpha, that scales the effect of sheep on goat growth in units of goat equivalents. Alpha gs is the scaling factor of sheep competitive effect on goats. I know that sounds kind of weird, but if you think about it, it makes perfect sense. If goats and sheep were exactly the same, and one sheep had the same effect on goat growth as adding one goat, then you wouldn't need a special coefficient here. Alpha GS would equal one. <clears throat> but if sheep are, say, bigger, than goats and eat more of the resources, or if sheep are aggressive to goats and depress the goat dynamic by more than the equivalent number of goats, then the alpha term would be greater than one. I like to think of alpha GS as the exchange rate of sheep for goats, 
like a currency exchange, allows you to convert dollars to euros. Alpha GS tells you how many sheep it would take to have the same effect as one goat on the dynamic of the goat growth. So the equation we use to describe the goat population dynamic for NG goats and NS sheep is this. DNG DT is equal to NG RG times KG minus NG minus alpha GS NS divided by KG. I hope that makes sense to you. The next step for us will be to use this equation to determine the set of all possible combinations of NG goats and NS sheep that will give us zero growth for the goats. So we look for the conditions in which DNG DT will be equal to zero. And this is going to happen, of course, if NG is equal to zero. Duh. No goats means there will be no increase in the number of goats. Yes. That is a solution, but it's also trivial. We're interested in non-zero numbers for both sheep and goats. So the other solutions for DNG DT equal to zero will require that the numerator of the logistic term KG minus NG minus alpha GS NS, that's got to equal zero. Now comes the fun part. We're going to create goat sheep space, or goat sheep universe, the universe of all possible combinations of NG goats and NS sheep. Again, this sounds weird, but it's depicted by a perfectly normal set of Cartesian coordinates in which the x-axis represents NS, the number of sheep, and the y-axis is NG, the number of goats. And we're only looking at this quadrant. The number of goats is allowed to range from zero to infinity as is the number of sheep. Now, if we plot kg minus ng minus alpha gs ns equal to zero on these coordinates, first, it will be a line. ns and ng are our x and y here, and there are no second order terms. k and alpha are both constants. Second, this line will be exactly what we need the graphical representation of all combinations of NG and NS, for which DNG DT is going to be exactly equal to zero, zero growth for the goats. Now the easiest way to plot this line is to use the intercept-intercept method. Set each variable in turn equal to zero to get where the line crosses the two axes, and then connect the intercepts. Setting ns equal to zero, the solution requires that ng is equal to kg. No big surprise here. With no sheep, you would expect zero growth for the goats to be reached where the number of goats reaches its carrying capacity. For the other intercept, we set ng equal to zero, and we get the solution of ns must be equal to kg over alpha gs. That's actually a number. Take the carrying capacity for goats divided by alpha. But here, that number is going to go on the sheep axis. It's the sheep intercept for our set of all zero goat growth combinations. We'll put the two intercepts on the graph and connect the dots. And that represents the zero growth isocline for goats. As long as we're at a number of sheep, a number of goats that's right on the line, the goats are at equilibrium neither increasing nor decreasing. What happens if we're off the line? Well, that's also pretty easy. Any point above and to the right of the isocline, the numbers of sheep and goats, NS and NG, are large enough such that the combination causes the numerator of the term to become negative. Goats decrease. Even here, where there are way fewer than kg goats, the number of sheep is large, and so the goats are still declining even though ng is less than kg. You have to account for the sheep, and when we throw a whole bunch of sheep into the mix, we end up with a high enough density of animals to cause the goats to decrease. Anywhere below and to the left of the isocline, the goats are going to increase. Note that the goats increasing 
is represented by a little arrow pointing upwards, the direction of increasing goats. Meanwhile, when the goats decrease, like out here, the arrow points downwards. Now we can do the same thing to work out the dynamic for sheep. One really nice thing about ecological competition is the symmetry of the interaction. The way that goats and sheep affect each other is essentially the same, and this cuts way down on the amount of explanation that's required in class. Everything we did for the goat dynamic is repeated for the sheep. DNS DT is equal to NSRS times KS minus NS minus alpha SG NG divided by KS. Here, alpha SG is the exchange rate of goats for sheep, or more precisely, the scaling factor to determine the effect of competition from NG goats on the growth of the sheep population, but in units of the number of sheep that would have that same effect. These alpha terms, by the way, are usually referred to as the competition coefficients. And these two dynamic equations for DNG DT and DNS DT are called the Latka Volterra equations for ecological competition, after the mathematical wizards that generated these formulations in the early 1900s. For sheep, the zero growth isocline is described by setting the discriminant function, which is the numerator of the term within the parentheses, to zero. Ks minus Ns minus alpha sg ng equal to zero. And now we can plot this line onto the same goat sheep space that we use for the goats. The sheep intercept we get by setting ng equal to zero, and that's going to be Ns is equal to Ks. And for this plot, I'm putting Ks out here to the right that is, at a value greater than the kg over alpha gs term, that's the intercept for the goat isocline. We get the goat intercept for the sheep isocline by setting ns equal to zero, and this gives us ng must be equal to ks divided by alpha sg. And for now, I'm setting this at a value greater than kg. So connecting these two intercepts, we have a sheep isocline that runs entirely outside of the goat isocline. Now, remember that any point on this sheep isocline, the number of sheep should neither increase nor decrease because DNS DT is equal to zero. Any point above and to the right of the isocline, the sheep decrease, and we represent this by a little arrow pointing to the left, which is the direction of declining sheep. Meanwhile, Anywhere below and to the left of the isocline, the sheep will increase, and that's represented by an arrow pointing to the right. So only now we can start to think about changes in the population size for both species simultaneously at any given point in the goat-sheep space. If we're below and to the left of both isoclines, down here on the inside of both, then both goats and sheep should increase, right? Well, an increase in the number of goats should be represented by a little arrow pointing straight up, and an increase in the number of sheep by a little arrow pointing to the right. If you combine those two arrows, accounting for an increase in both sheep and goats, you have an arrow that points upwards and to the right. That's the direction pointed from any point that's on the inside of both isoclines. If, on the other hand, you have numbers for both sheep and goats that puts you to the right and above both isoclines, then both species are decreasing, and the combined arrows gives you a direction for the two species change pointing down and to the left. Down because the goats are decreasing, and to the left because the sheep are also decreasing. Stop and rerun the video here if you need to. It's just a matter of applying the rules. If you're outside of the sheep isocline, that's the green line, sheep decrease, arrows point left. If you're inside the sheep isocline, the sheep increase, arrow points right. If you're outside the goat isocline, red, the goats decrease, arrow points down. If you're on the inside of the goat isocline, goats increase and the arrow points up. You have to combine the arrows for both goats 
and sheep to get the combined arrow or vector is the appropriate term here because there's really a direction of change and a magnitude. We won't worry about the magnitude here, just the direction. Every point in goat sheep space is associated with a vector of change. It shows you where the two species population sizes should be in one time interval to the future, say one year. Starting at this point here, one year later we should be in a new position with fewer sheep and fewer goats, but maybe still outside the sheep isocline. One more year and we're on the sheep isocline. At that point, what happens? Well, the sheep don't change. No left or right movement. But the goats, we're still outside of the goat isocline, right? So the goats are going to decrease. So the arrow has to point, yes, downward. Now we're in the space in between the two isoclines. Inside the sheep isocline means that, yes, sheep will increase arrow must point right. But we're outside of the goat isocline and so the arrow points down. Combined arrow points down and to the right. That's going to be true from any point between the two isoclines. We have just projected the changes in our two species community over four years. If we continue from here, we'll go down and to the right, down to the right, until we hit the sheep axis, which means we have no more goats, right? So with NG is equal to zero, the sheep have to go to NS is equal to KS. No goats, KS sheep. It looks like the sheep have driven the goats to local extinction and have gone to their own carrying capacity. Now what if we start down here? Both species increase up and to the right. Both species increase again. And again, and now we're on the goat isocline. Goats don't change, no movement up or down, but the sheep are inside of their isocline and so they, yeah, increase. Arrow points to the right. Now we're in the area where all the arrows point down and to the right, same outcome. Within a relatively short amount of time, measured in years rather than millennia, the outcome of two species sharing the same island in ecological competition is that there's only one species on the island, just the sheep, and no more interspecies competition. That last part is key to something we'll be talking about soon. We start out with two species in competition, and within a few years we have only one species, without competition from the other species. Now we can change the conditions so that the goad isocline is on the outside. Call these conditions set B. Set A is for the sheep winning result that we just got. If KG is larger than KS over alpha SG and KS is smaller than KG over alpha GS, the red line, the goat isocline, is entirely outside of the green line, which is the sheep isocline. In other words, the relative positions of the isoclines are reversed relative to conditions in set A. Now, if we start on the outside of both isoclines, both species decline again, down and to the left, until we hit the goat isocline. From this point, the goats don't change, no movement up or down, but the sheep are still outside of their isocline, and so they decrease arrow points to the left. In the space between the two isoclines, the arrows are going to point up and to the left because the sheep are decreasing, that's the left part, and the goats are increasing, that's the up part. Keep on going in this direction and within a short amount of time you hit the goat axis and finally end up with kg goats and zero sheep. Same result if you start below both isoclines. Under set B conditions, two species ecological competition results again in one species driving the other to local extinction. The situation with two species sharing the island doesn't last, only this time it's the goats winning. You might have already guessed where we're going next with this analysis. 
if the two isoclines were to cross, say Kg is greater than Ks over alpha Sg and Ks is greater than Kg over alpha Gs, then you would have a crossing point where dn dt for both species is equal to zero. So this would be an equilibrium defined as a point where there's no change expected for either species. dns dt is equal to dng dt is equal to zero. At the crossing point, neither goats nor sheep is expected to change. And so this means that goats and sheep are going to coexist harmoniously forever and always, right? Well, no. You see, there are two kinds of equilibrium, stable and unstable. In your math classes, you'll learn about how to distinguish a stable equilibrium from an unstable one based purely on numerical analysis. But there's also a more practical way. If you make a small disturbance to a system that is in equilibrium, if the equilibrium is stable, then it will always go back to that equilibrium. If it's unstable, then the small disturbance will result in the system moving away from that equilibrium. In other words, you don't go back. Think about a marble sitting perfectly at the top of a dome. As long as it isn't disturbed, it will remain where it is without rolling off. But as soon as you nudge it off its spot, that's a small disturbance, it will start rolling away from where it was sitting. This is an unstable equilibrium. The crossing point in this graph is also an unstable equilibrium. If you were to add a couple of goats, you would start by moving down and to the left. But then you get to the goat isocline first. At that point, you see no change in the goats, but the sheep will be declining. You move left into the area between the two isoclines. Anywhere in that little triangle up and to the left of the crossing point of the two isoclines, the goats are going to be increasing and the sheep are decreasing. Arrow goes up and to the left. And the outcome is one where sheep go to zero and the goats are going to go to their carrying capacity kg. The fact that we moved away from the crossing point means that it's an unstable equilibrium. If we started at that same crossing point but took away two goats instead of adding them, look what happens. First, we move up and to the right because we're below both isoclines. Again, we hit the goat isocline first, but this time sheep will increase while the goats stay the same. This puts us between the two isoclines only on the other side from where we were before, down and to the right of the crossing. Anywhere in this area, and the sheep increase while the goats decrease. Final outcome, sheep go to their carrying capacity, Ks, while the goats go to zero. Again, we're starting out with a two species situation and end up pretty quickly with only one species. Now, note that each of these two final results, Ks sheep and zero goats, and Kg goats and zero sheep, they're also equilibria zero growth projected for both species from each of those points. Take a moment to process that. Now if we were to start at this equilibrium where the sheep are at their carrying capacity and add two goats, the goats are going to decline. We just go right back to zero goats and Ks sheep. This is a stable equilibrium. Likewise for Kg goats and zero sheep. This set of conditions call it set C, has three equilibria, two stable and one unstable. The fact that the equilibrium with two species is the unstable one means that even here, we will be getting one species going to its carrying capacity and the other going to local extinction. Sure, there are two possible final outcomes here, but both stable equilibrium involve only one species present. And so there's really no chance even here for two species coexistence. In all three of the condition sets we have presented so far, ecological competition between two species is a short-lived phenomenon. One species ends up winning and the other species goes locally extinct, after which point there is no further interspecies competition. 
This is potentially a very meaningful result because it sets up interspecies competition to be a weak or non-existent player in shaping the long-term evolution of organisms. In order to adapt to the presence of sheep, you need to at least be exposed to sheep consistently over thousands of generations. How can goats ever evolve to become better competitors against sheep if they either drive sheep to extinction or themselves are driven to local extinction within a handful of generations? This illustrates two different scales of time as required for ecological processes or evolutionary change. You can say that in these scenarios, the result of one species winning and the other going locally extinct is an outcome occurring on an ecological timescale. But in order to co-evolve and adapt to the presence of a competing species requires much more time, something on an evolutionary timescale. Both of these timescales are long compared with what most people are accustomed to thinking about. And there might even be a tendency for some people to lump them together as long time periods. But they are very distinct, and ignoring the difference between them is something we do at our own peril. Now think about human-caused climate change and its long-term repercussions. Sure, life has withstood climate change in the past. Many, many times, in fact. Things got super cold in the Ordovician, and again in the Devonian twice, and of course you have the Carboniferous, not to mention the Ice Age glaciations occurring in the Cenozoic. In between the cold spells, the world was much warmer, and the world was consistently a lot hotter than it is today through most of the Mesozoic. Life has had to evolve and adapt to climatic changes that have occurred throughout the Phanerozoic. Why should things be different now? The expected human-caused global warming of 2 to 5 degrees Celsius is actually small compared with the climatic changes in the Earth's past. Why not have some confidence in life's resilience, its ability to once again roll with the punches? Well, I'll tell you. It's a time scale issue. Warming and cooling in the past has transpired mostly on long time scales. The geologic events forcing these climatic changes were very gradual, and in the case of biogenic causes, they were themselves the outcome of evolutionary shifts. Think a time scale slow enough that evolution could keep pace. The one time when climate changed as suddenly as it is happening today was at the end of the Permian, with the atmospheric changes brought on by the Siberian Traps superplume, and we all know how that turned out for life. Okay, so there's one more set of conditions we haven't considered yet. Set D, in which the inequalities of set C are reversed. Ks is going to be less than Kg over alpha Gs, and Kg less than Ks over alpha Sg. The isoclines cross again, but if you work out the directions the arrows are pointing, you'll realize that this time the crossing point is in fact a stable equilibrium. Under these conditions, the goats and sheep are coexisting. Maybe not in perfect harmonious bliss, but at least the model predicts them to share the island without one driving the other to extinction. But let's look closely at this set of conditions, which is the only one out of the four possible sets of conditions that allows for two species coexistence. Both of these inequalities require that k is less than k divided by alpha. And this means that the alpha terms for both species, alpha gs and alpha sg, must be small, much less than 1. The alpha terms, however, reflect the degree of competitive effect, sheep on goats and goats on sheep. In fact, we even called them the competition coefficients. In effect, by saying that this set D of inequalities represents the only conditions under which two species can coexist, we're saying that a requirement for two species coexistence is that the competition be sufficiently weak. But if both competitive coefficients are very small, as required by this model, then the two species are not really competing in the first place. 
A hard, simple conclusion of this analysis is as follows. Competing species will not coexist. This is the principle of competitive exclusion. And it's actually one of the very basic lessons we get out of a disciplined mathematical approach to ecology. It's hard to argue with math. To the extent that this model, based on the lotka volterra formulations for ecological competition, accurately describes the interaction between two species, there is no way for two species that actually compete with each other to coexist. This understanding provides a foundation for other biological insights. For example, think about two species evolving and adapting to have more productive interactions with each other. The fungal ancestors of the mycorrhizae that now benefit the plants that they invade weren't always so beneficial to the plants. It probably started out as a parasitism. And the fungi weren't always gaining the same degree of benefit from the plants as they do in modern mycorrhizal associations. Fungus and plant both had to evolve. Each underwent evolutionary change in response to the other. And this is what co-evolution is. In order for this to happen, it wouldn't do if plants had driven the fungus to local extinction or if the fungus killed off all the plants and had to carry on life as to tritivores living in the soil. Coexistence is a necessary prerequisite to coevolution. And what we're saying in today's lesson is that competing species don't coexist and therefore you should not expect them to coevolve. And consequently, they should not possess any adaptations that are specifically driven by interspecies competition. If you look at other kinds of community interactions, other than ecological competition, that is, you can have parasite host interactions. You can have predator prey interactions. You can have mutualist mutualist interactions. All of these are going to be more conducive to two species coexistence than is competition. Parasites are not going to drive their hosts to extinction lest they go extinct themselves. And hosts might want to rid themselves of their parasites, and maybe they do. Who knows how many parasite species have successfully been driven extinct by their hosts. But the parasites that do persist, and their hosts, must manage to exist in the presence of the other, and will be continually adapting one to the other, and this is the definition of coevolution. Mutualists are obviously going to coexist. You can expect to see adaptations of mutualist species in response to their partners. In fact, it may be that most kinds of interspecies interactions are going to permit long-term coexistence and coevolution, and competition is really the exception. Complete this sentence. We don't expect to see evidence of organisms having evolved in response to ecological competitors because right because they don't coexist over evolutionary time as would be required for coevolution to happen so let's see how this plays out at some point in the future you're sitting in a lecture and you hear your instructor describe the phenomenon of character displacement look this up in your textbook it's there, guaranteed. The general idea is this. If you have two species, a favorite example comes from none other than the Galapagos finches. Two species of finch, A and B. When you find each alone on its own island, they have pretty similar beak sizes. But if you go to an island on which both species are present, they have much less morphological overlap. In my picture, the beak of species A is smaller than what you see on species A by itself, and the beak of species B is larger when it's together with A than what you find when B is by itself. The inference here is that the two species must have evolved to have less overlap with the other species, effectively reducing the competition coefficient to the point where they can coexist. Maybe in the past they had alpha GS and alpha SG values that were higher, 
but they evolved to have less overlap with the other species and made themselves less competitive with the other species. What's the problem here? Right. If the Latka Volterra analysis is correct, this should never happen. If you actually put A and B from the different islands onto the same island, that is, with their beaks overlapping in size, competition would be strong, and one species drives the other to local extinction in the span of a handful of generations. Not enough time to allow for evolution to change the species. There's a conflict here. You can't say in one breath that competitive exclusion prevents the coexistence of competitors, and then in the next breath that these finches evolved in response to competition from similar finch species. Either competitive exclusion is wrong, and I know you can't argue with math, or there might be some other factors mitigating what actually is a real dynamic that disallows competing species from coexisting. In the case of the finches, it could be that the food resources on a larger island, where you're more likely to find A and B together, will be more diverse than what you find on smaller islands. Maybe there's an abundance of large seeds for one of the finch species, say B, to specialize on it, and it subsequently evolves to have larger bills that allow them to better exploit this great resource. And this would leave a different resource, maybe small seeds, also in adequate abundance, to be underused and available to support a second population of finch, maybe species A. That species then goes on to evolve smaller beaks as it adapts to make use of its resource. If this is the case, the driving force behind the evolutionary change is not competition so much as it is the kind of food resource being exploited by the birds. The finches were adapting in response to their food, not in response to the other species. And so this phenomenon of character displacement might need to be recast in terms other than evolution in response to competing species. Now, just the fact that we needed a better explanation here than evolution in response to competition in order to explain the big morphologies that we're seeing, this is an insight that we've gained, that you've gained, by understanding the implications of the mathematical analysis that we've conducted in today's video. In the next video, the last lecture of the semester, we'll be talking about more ecological situations that could potentially allow for two competing species to coexist and coevolve. Sure, today's lesson was super fun and it gave us an opportunity to apply powerful logic to draw important insights about community ecology and evolution. But there are limits to mathematical models like today's, most notably the way that we had to distill things down to the main players. We had sheep and goats and their interaction with each other, and that was it. This system was tractable for us, that is, we were able to do the math and come up with some clear conclusions because it is so simple. If you make your system more complex than this, you quickly run into a brick wall of intractable mathematics. Now, my office mate Joe, the physicist, loves his nonlinear dynamical systems, but the behavior of ecosystem models of greater complexity are largely inscrutable and sometimes chaotic. And therein lies a certain degree of fascination, mystique even. But I can't let the semester end on that note. And so in the next lecture, I'll be attempting to close out the term with a few examples of community dynamics that fall within our general comfort zone.